next presentation, Jennifer Molesworth, who is a fisheries and aquatic biologist, has worked for the Forest Service and now works for Bureau of Reclamation, uh, is going to speak to us about the fires and the effects on the aquatic ecosystem and fish in particular. Uh, Right. Thanks everyone for coming out. Um, Susan, you thought you were just going to have a sip wine, but since you wanted to watch this last week, <laughs> if you have any comments while we're playing, playing this, it's only five, five or six minutes. Uh, if you want me to stop it while it's going, um, I'll do that, and we can talk about it if you want. Uh, so it is. After the Carlton fire burned and after the storms and the flooding. And it's on uh, Vimeo, I think, right? Yeah. I want to watch it at home. So we're sliding down um, Pipestone Canyon. And you can see there's some green in there. It didn't all burn up. You can see those steep slopes and that sandstone. Campbell Lake coming up. I think there's a golden eagle nest somewhere around there where there used to be. And now he's going to fly um, up towards uh, Cougar Lake where the fire began. Again, you can see green still left. Not a complete burn. And also how open it is on which of the shrub step Right, you guys hear that? Some more severe fire there. So the, the brown trees would be like low severity? area where the fire began. This, this, this part of the fire, there was also the fire that started down around Carlton. So now we're flying up Beaver Creek and we're going up Highway 20. That is um, the Stokes Ranch underneath us right there. And so veering off to the right is uh, um, Fraser Creek and to the left is Upper Beaver Creek. So the fire actually came down Beaver Creek and then also up went blue to the right up Finley, uh, Fraser Creek and Finley Canyon. And now you can start to see some of the flood effects after we had that really high intensity rainstorm. All the culverts on the highway were undersized, pathetically undersized, and no way could handle Fraser Creek in this state. You can see how Fraser Creek spread across its floodplain and it ran down the highway. The floodplain for Fraser Creek is actually where the highway sits. That piece right there is um, where uh, Fraser Creek actually wants to be, where the highway is. And who would have known, right? I mean, we would have never expected Fraser Creek to get up and move like this. <clears throat> You can see it's trying to make a sinuous pattern there. And, okay, now we're going to Benson Creek. And again, so Benson Creek had the lakes, the winter lakes that had dams that broke because there was so much water. And also um, the fork of Benson Creek that comes in from the east also was tremendous how much water came down there and then contributed to the dam break water. You can see Benson Creek getting out on its floodplain and spreading sediment across the floodplain, which I think is a good thing. It gets it up and out of the system from an aquatic habitat standpoint. That, that's good. Not so good for the landowners. So Winter Lakes is up to our left and then that other fork goes to the right and that also blew out in a really big way. We're flying up to the lakes and some of them are empty. 
So to the right, um, right there, that's, that really is where a lot of stuff came out. So here we had the shrub step burn and, and high severity fire, plus we had a tremendous amount of rain. It was a really, this part of the, the fire in this area and over into the Chilliwist was the most severe burn and also had the highest severity rainfall. It had something like, I don't know, three or four inches of rain in a very short amount of time. <clears throat> Feel free to pipe up if you want to know or want me to stop. <laughs> I think so. Yes. yes, we are. So the Finley Canyon is really interesting. It's this, you know, all this, there's actually a divide here, so all of this does not drain this way. It's kind of like a closed basin almost. If it had all the way gone all the way through, it would have been much worse. This is, um, goes back down the lower Beaver Creek right here. And thanks to Fred Wirt for that. Um, he has a much longer one, and if you watch it at home on your computer, it looks a lot better than it does on this picture here. Okay, so um, this is looking up Highway 20 to the east, and um, this little orange thing down here in the bottom is um, our kayak on a trailer, and we were had just left our home that had been burned over and we had this all of our stuff and you know <laughs> weird loads on the highway there was a lot of really strange loads of stuff driving around in those days like snowmobiles people with snowmobiles and everything right it was pretty bizarre but anyway we just left home and um the fire come down beaver creek started up at by cooper lake and came down beaver creek um amazingly fast and uh, actually burned down the creek and then this is it um, heading up and over uh, Fraser Creek. This would be uh, the Finley Canyon area here. So then it you know it blew up and over and over into the Chilliwist, and the Chilliwist got hit amazingly hard. Um, I don't know if any of you've been over there, but it also had a lot of fire and flooding and loss of houses. Uh, so I'm going to tonight talk about the a few of the fish species that we have here in the Mahound just kind of give a little refresher on that and, and what it takes for them to be able to survive big disturbances like this. They're actually um, quite adapted to it. And what kind of, um, what are the habitat requirements for them to be successful and be able to survive events like this? Talk about the, the fire and the, the flood event and then um, what, what I think the impacts to fish and habitat are from that. and maybe what will happen next. <laughs> I've got too many buttons here. So, um, and I, there's some fish books up there, some fish guides for the Methow. I only brought 20 copies. So, if somebody doesn't get one and they want one, come see me or let Julie know and I will get you a copy if you want one. Um, so, Spring Chinook, Summer Chinook, Steelhead, Bull Trout, Cutthroat, Pacific Lamprey, Whitefish, and a bunch of others. I'm just going to talk about the uh, top three and a little bit about Lamprey. Uh, what Medhow Watershed, in case you didn't know where we are. <laughs> That's the laser. So the red is, is pretty much the range of Spring Chinook and um, and steelhead, um, and then also bull trout. Steelhead and also goes up Beaver Creek, and so there's, and then the shape of the watershed is right here, almost Canada, and uh, a million acres. So it's a big, it's a big watershed. And then that's over here is the Okanagan, which was also affected by the Carlton fire. Chinook salmon. We have two different um, runs of sam of Chinook salmon here in the Medhow. We have a spring run and a summer run. The spring run um, 
arrives, it's when they enter, the name is based on when they enter the Columbia River down at the ocean, um, about 600 miles from here. Uh, they enter, the spring run enters in April, May. They get here around June and they spawn in August. Their eggs hatch right in March, so soon. And then they'll spend a year here in the Manhattan before they head down to the ocean. And while they're here, they're looking for habitats um, that will protect them. So quieter refuge areas on the sides of the main channel when they're very young, uh, large wood, roots of tangles of roots, um, wetlands, beaver ponds, side channels. So connected habitats. That's a, a slide at the beginning talked about a complex, cool, and connected. So that's where some of that's coming from. And then the summer run, they're different. They, uh, they spawn lower in the system, and they spawn in September, late September and October. And as soon as their babies come out of the gravel in the spring, they begin their journey to the ocean. So it's a different strategy. They get bigger, so they, you know, they spend more time out at sea, and they, they grow larger, they can create more eggs. And, uh, and they use those lower habitats. So during the Carlton fire, they were actually down low in the system and probably got impacted a lot more than the spring chinook. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay. Uh, and how, how far up did the summers get in the system? They go a, maybe a few miles up the Chiwak and up maybe as far as Weeman Bridge on the main stem of the Methow. So they're mainly spawning in the main stem of the Methow. And then the, the spring chinook, they'll spawn in the twist and the upper Medhow, Chiwuk, and the bottoms of a lot of the tributaries. In terms of relative numbers, are there far more springers than summer? No, there's far more summers than springers. So springers are listed as endangered. Uh, summers are not. They, summers are not really sure on the... They're more of a hatchery run, so really tremendous hatchery production and uh, kept alive by the Wells Hatchery. Um, and I think genetically, they were they tried to list them a while ago, and um, I think genetically they're just maybe not representative of what was here originally. Steelhead are rainbow trout that decide to go to the ocean which is kind of interesting. Um, and chances are, you know, steelhead's offspring are gonna go to sea, but a resident rainbow trout that he could also, or she could also decide to go to sea. And there's a lot of things that can happen that, you know, if you think about the advantages to go in the ocean or not, it's really, really risky to take a long journey like that, because it's 600 miles just to get there, and then it's huge once you do get there. Um, but if you do get there, then there's a lot of, you know, the marine, uh, a lot of really rich marine resources, and you can get a lot bigger if you decide to go to sea. Um, but then you've got to come back, which is also <laughs> fairly challenging. So some will decide not to go, and uh, the Chinook will do this as well, and so will bull trout. Although bull trout don't go to ski sea, they go to the Rain River, but. Whether or not they decide to, to move or to go uh, or to stay, I'm not sure what the environmental triggers are, but sometimes things like a big disturbance might make them decide one way or the other, if that's what they actually do. Um, it can also be like an energetic thing, maybe temperature, uh, where they just, they haven't been here long enough to put on enough Fat or resources to make the journey, so they just end up staying and staying and staying. Like our, some of our steelhead will stay here for up to seven years before they decide they're ready to make the journey. Um, so they kind of do a lot of different things. You might have then a big old female come back from the ocean, and the little male that decided not to go to sea <laughs> and gets in there with her and or he'll sneak in amongst the, the bigger guys and, and do his business. Um, and the, the Chinook will do that as well, much, to a much lesser extent. So 
So it's interesting um, just to think about that, all the different combinations of things that they will do. It's not just go to the ocean and come back. It's not the only option. Bull trout do the same kind of thing, only they do it locally here. You'll have some that'll stay up high in the smaller streams and complete their entire life cycle, and you'll have others that will migrate into the Columbia River and go all over the place. They might go down to the Eniat, you know, and come back, or go over to the Snake River and come back. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, really. I mean, not many of them do that, but they have the capability of doing it, and some of them do. And then also we can get some of those fish coming here, so it's kind of a way for them to mix it up a little. Um, the fish that stay resident are pretty small, and then the ones that actually migrate, they can migrate down into the Medhow, they get a little bit bigger, like maybe a 14-inch fish. Or if they decide they want to go to the Columbia, they'll come back as a, a very, you know, maybe uh, two or three feet long. So really beautiful, beautiful animals. And they spawn in the smallest streams. So way up in the Twisp River, way up the Chiwak River, and they just climb into these really teeny little streams, and that's where they spawn. Quite vulnerable up there. And also have requirements for very cool, cool water temperature in the summer, and um, very complex habitat. So getting back to that first slide, cool, complex, connected. Uh, and then also wanting those off-channel habitats. Lamprey are also an anadromous species, meaning they go to sea, which is pretty cool. So they go down there and they turn into adults while they're there, and then they come back up here. They spawn in much the same places that um, salmon and steelhead will spawn. And um, when the amnesites erupt or emerge from the gravel, they'll find a silty, silty spot and stay there for um, four years or so, and a lot of times those are your really nice beaches along the rivers. <laughs> think think uh, little lamprey larvae. And these guys are actually have been having a pretty hard time. Um, the runs coming back from the ocean have been really, really dismal. They were a little bit better last year. And this is a fish like the salmon, like to the Native Americans. This was a very, very important um, species to them. Very really oily fish and so a lot of value there. And then they, the numbers that they came back in were just incredible back in the day and they're almost diminished to nothing. They're also interesting in that they don't necessarily, um, if they were spawned there, return to that exact same spot. They're more cued in on whether or not there's another, there's lamprey already up there, they can sense that, detect that, and they'll go back home. So it's, so if you don't have any lamprey where they came from, if some reason they got wiped out, there won't be any signal telling them that's where they need to go. So as these populations diminish, like as we lose our Chiwak run, or if we've lost our Beaver Creek run of lamprey, there's no way for them to find their way back there. There's, they are thinking about um, trying to plant them out. The Yakima Nation is trying to develop some programs like that. And this is the salmon life cycle, so it is a circle. Um, and I don't know where the beginning or the end is. It's kind of like the chicken and the egg. You know, what, what comes first. They do come from here, though. I mean, they are born here. Um, and start with around three to 4,000 eggs. Then maybe you'll get 800 fry hatch out of the gravel. 200 will survive the environment here to make it to the ocean. And then 10 will make it to adulthood, and then maybe only two will come back. And that's if we're doing well. So that if we get two back from one red, we're thinking that they're replacing themselves and we're, we're doing all right. So there's a, lot, there's a lot going on in each one of those places where the salmon go out in the ocean is obviously huge and there's there's so many things happening out there that can affect them. I think last year they had a really good year for some reason. They had a huge run last year come back. Um, these are based on the dam being in place. These numbers 
No, I don't think so. I think, um, you know, out on the coast as well, I mean, there's just a lot going on. The dams are getting better. They're not perfect, but so certainly that's the challenge, one of them. But coastal ones have a lot of issues as well. Everything wants to eat them. <laughs> Their job is to feed everybody. So everyone likes, you know, from the eggs to the fry. I mean, it's food for all of us and all the animals out there. Including their carcasses once they die. Those two salmon there. So it's almost like they're never really die they never really die. They just get transformed into something else. Resilience. So the capacity to recover from disturbance. So this would be, um, there's genetic factors and, and, you know, like the tree that can survive the fire. How vigorous is the animal? Um, how many of them are there? The diversity of habitat. And not only in any one moment in time, but through time. So habitats come and go, and that's part of this disturbance cycle. And there's a successional, you know, uh, thing going on with the habitats where sometimes it's a really good habitat and it provides everything in abundance and then other times it doesn't. But as long as you have a watershed that has different habitats in different stages of that succession, you're going to be doing all right. It's when everything is one way or the other then you're going to have some problems. Because if you do have a big disturbance, you've kind of got all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. And, and um, so you just can't, you can't just cover all the bases. Does that make sense? Um, and you kind of have that idea going on in every single one of those habitats from the ocean, the rivers, the estuaries, up to here. So they're dealing with it all throughout that, that cycle. When they're here, we think of um, a habitat as functioning really at a high state when it's very well connected to its floodplain, and there's a lot of diversity of habitats. You have a lot of wood in the channel, nice deep pools, good gravels, good connection to springs or hyperig flow. Hyperig flow is like water that comes from under the river and up into the river. It's like subterranean water. And how complex a habitat is, how complex a river is, actually feeds the hyperion flow. So it feeds back on itself. And then also diversity of habitats. If we think about, you know, gravels and wood and all of that stuff, where does it come from? Where, where, does, that, where does that messiness come from? It just doesn't kind of arise out of the air. It, it, it usually comes from disturbance. So the way that these habitats are maintained is actually through disturbance. And connectivity, so the fish have to be able to get places. This is true for any animal. So if you have like culverts that are too small, or dams that are blocking small streams. Sometimes beaver dams could be temporary barriers as well. You need to have all of your habitats connected to each other so the fish can get there. And uh, so that's a really important point too is just how well connected things are. Yeah, so where does that sediment come from? And when I say sediment, there's like fine, silty, sandy stuff. And then there's also like big rocks. <laughs> so that's all kind of, some of it's sediment, some of it's bed load, but it's things that are delivered to, to the river that the river moves with water. Large wood landslides and things like that also deliver large wood or trees die along the side of the river and they fall in, redistributed by stream flow. And how, how that, what that looks like depends on how steep the stream is. If it's flat, it looks one way, like the upper Methow is all braided and it goes all over the place because it's 
fairly flat and it's got a very big coarse sediment load relative to its stream flow, so it can't move it, it moves around it. Um, valley width, how, high, how wide is the valley? If it's really, really wide, then the river can move or the stream can move all over the place through it. If it's very narrow and confined in a really tight valley, then it's not going to move, move very much at all. There's an example of a fairly confined reach of the Metha River between Carlton and Twisp. That lower reach, if you're rafting down towards Carlton, it's, it gets to be just a single thread channel. It's nice and deep, and it's not, not real braided once you, you drop down just above Carlton there. And again, connected. So this picture right here is um, the a road of Beaver Creek that is um, eroding. <laughs> it's becoming not a road. Uh, it's, this is Volstead Creek and it's running into this ditch and uh, here's the road. So the road is disappearing and um, being delivered into Beaver Creek. It was a pretty extensive event with all, and, and might actually be more of an effect of um, the last fire, the tripod fire in 2006, um, followed by a road located on top of a stream channel with not a whole lot of um, acknowledgement that it actually was a stream channel or is. And then I <laughs> stole this from Susan, <laughs> trying to think about fish in, in these terms, like fish, uh, salmon and steelhead are a little bit weedy in the way they behave and can colonize places. Um, and it's programmed in them genetically and then also kind of presented to them by the environment. Um, and as we lose populations, we lose that diversity and that memory of, of the things that you, are possible for the species to do. So multiple life strategies is what I was talking about earlier when they might decide to head to the ocean or not head to the ocean or they might decide to stray or not stray or just home right back to where they came from um, or part of the population is really, really good at climbing really steep streams and the other part of the population um, would prefer flatter water. And eventually what happens is they diverge and you end up with a race that, like the summer Chinook, or a race like the spring Chinook, where you have, you know, you either, your babies go to sea right away and have more time out at the ocean or they spend more time in the tributaries. It's a different strategy and it has different um, pros and cons to it, trade-offs. Um, the years at sea, so here's a really good one, so that the fish, so you have a, an age class of fish there, you have a red, and all those fish, like three or 4,000 eggs in the red, and they might decide, um, all those fish head out to sea, and when they're out there, some might return right away when they're two years old. Some might stay for three years, some might stay for four, some might stay for five. An odd one might stay for six. So you have this bell-shaped bell curve of when those fish come back to the <coughs> house. And most of them come back here, but some don't. Some might decide to go somewhere else. Um, so what that does so is if you have a disaster back home, your fish, the fish that decide to come back home that year are going to find a changed environment. They might, it's not going to work for them. But thankfully, their brothers and sisters are still out at sea, and they'll be coming back the next year when things hopefully are better. So, kind of interesting. And then food webs, um, the ability uh, of these animals to find things to eat. The fish themselves are a source of nutrients. They bring that back from the ocean in the form of their, their bodies. When they die, it feeds a lot of things. The riparian tree species and the composition along the banks, uh, alders, are a really tremendous, or trees like alders, like deciduous trees, are a really tremendous nutrient source for our rivers and streams. Their leaves fall in and they fix nitrogen and things like that. 
compared to conifers. And then how open is the stream? So solar radiation and photosynthesis can also fuel the food chain. And then competition with other um, fish. How big's your population? How, how packed in are they given the food resource that you might have? What are the other species doing? Like the methow, for example, is really full of whitefish. Most of the food energy in the main stem of the methow goes to whitefish, not to salmon. So the salmon are looking for those side channel habitats where there aren't whitefish and where they have more of a chance to get at the food. The solar radiation and photosynthesis, shades are really important considerations. So on the one hand, it's nice to have that primary production happening in, your, in the water and in the streams. But on the other hand, you don't want so little shade that the temperature gets too high that it's um, lethal to the fish. 